on what the Spirit... Amen. We're going to be in the book of Judges. The book of Judges is, a, is the seventh book in the Old Testament, and it is a series, most of you know, it is a series of 12 judges that God appointed to lead or judge the children of Israel. God would deliver His people from time from the time of Joshua all the way to Samuel. This is the period of which the book of Judges is written. There was a uh, consistent pattern of the people being unfaithful to God, and then He would allow them to be overtaken by their enemies. And then the people would repent, cry out to God for mercy, and He would raise up a judge again, or a leader, or a champion, or a hero. Everybody say hero. Who would lead them out again, or give them a word, or direct them again, and they would begin to prosper. And then soon fall right back into unfaithfulness again, and the cycle would continue. How many can relate to that, honestly? We turn to God, we, we seek the Lord, God begins to bless us, and we get busy, and, and we, we, we are blessed, and things begin to happen in our life, and then if we're not careful, we begin to drift, and we begin to get too consumed with the things that God has blessed us with, and we lose our focus sometimes, and we go back, and then uh, we, we go through a situation that brings us back to God. It's not that God is doing that, but God is not the one who walked away in the relationship. How many know it's us? God said, I'll never leave you or forsake you. He's right here. But when we can't hear him or we don't feel like he's working in our life, how many know it's not him that's the problem? Amen? Not to be mean this morning or anything like that, but sometimes and oftentimes, how many know that the blessed and prosperous seasons in our lives that we get into trouble? When times are bad... It's easy to cry out to God when things are hard. Anybody can cry out to God when things are bad. Uh, I tell people this all the time, that when things are bad or hard or tough or calamity comes, people will automatically come together. You can have a bad situation. You can even post it on Facebook, and people that you didn't even think liked you that much that might have been on your friends list will start commenting and saying things that you just couldn't believe it. They they care. They begin to pray. They begin to say things. They support you. They share your need. They share your situations. It's amazing to me that how in bad times or hard times, people will come together sometimes more than in seasons of blessing. Unity is often easier when there's trouble than when things are good. Amen. Last week we talked about unity and the five things that disrupt unity. But I have learned over the years and in my lifetime that as God begins to bless me and as God begins to bless other people, that sometimes that that disrupts unity as well because God is blessing you and prospering you. And sometimes people get jealous and they say, well, how come he's not doing me that way? Or I've, I've worked harder than they have or I've been through more stuff than them. And, and how come, how come, how come? And it begins to separate us instead of realizing when God is blessing something or someone, you need to be a part of that. Amen? We need to come together even more during that because that's the thing that the enemy uses to destroy us or separate us. And so we need to not only be together. It works in marriages. I've, I've dealt with marriages for 20 some years in ministry now. And, and it's, it's when, when marriages are struggling and they're fighting and they're having a hard time, it seems like, or a calamity will happen. It seems like the husband and wife sometimes come together more and they fight. And then when things get smooth or the child gets well or the, the financial situation gets better, God begins to bless them that all of a sudden they begin to, to drift away. And feel like they don't have as much in common. And part of that is just because um, when you have something in common with somebody, if you're both in the boat that's going down, you both want to oar or patch the hole. Amen? But when they're on a cruise ship and the seas are good, (laughs) you get to start thinking about me and my. Amen? Good times reveal what's in the heart as much or more than bad times. That's why it's so amazing to me and so easy for me. Uh, God, God revealed this years ago, that grace reveals the heart. 
People used to be afraid of preaching grace and teaching real grace. The grace, you know, that, that we, we can't even get our mind wrapped around sometimes that God's grace is so good. And that He's so merciful to us. And, and when the grace of God comes and you, you quit trying to control people with fear and guilt and condemnation or the threat of hell or whatever, and you begin to preach the grace of God to people, it will reveal what's in their heart because whatever they want to do is what they're going to do. You forgive somebody for something, if they do it again, you know it was in their heart to do. They didn't accidentally do it. You see what I'm saying? Grace, the Bible says, teaches us to deny ungodliness. And so grace reveals the heart. Good times will reveal the heart. And this is terrible, mean, and evil. But any of you see the things like on YouTube or that are posted when there's a couple and they win the lottery? The guy will win the lottery or have a lottery ticket and all of a sudden he'll come home and then he will tell his wife or girlfriend what he really thinks of her because now he's got he thinks he's got millions of dollars it's usually a prank when they do that somebody will will prank them and make them think that they won and then what's really in their heart will just come out i feel so sorry for some of those wives or husbands it works both ways on the pranks if you've seen them because they just all of a sudden i never liked you in the first place you know i don't like your mom your family i don't like none of them and now because i got money i don't have to deal with you anymore i'll get me a new girlfriend i'll get me a new husband i amen some of you are telling each other we're not buying a lottery ticket no more honey <laughs> you buy a lottery ticket and win the first thing you better do is get to this church amen bless the lord Tithe on that puppy and offering. The blessings in the offering. (laughs) I didn't mean to go there. Um, But how many are thankful for God's mercy over and over in our life? And have you ever entertained the thought? You don't have to raise your hands because I know that a lot of people do this. But have you, you ever entertained the thought that I'm a nobody? My life doesn't matter. I'm not a big deal. I've never accomplished much. I'm not or never will be famous. Tell your neighbor, look at him right now. It's okay that you're a nobody. (laughs) That'll build them up right there. Amen. They just fired up, ready to go now. It's okay that you're a nobody. Why do so many people think like that? I think it has to do a lot, or it has a lot to do with most people want to make a difference. And we tend to compare ourselves to other people who we think are making a difference. We tend to compare ourselves to uh, uh, different kinds of situations or what other people have done or what their kids are doing or how well their kids versus my kids or those kinds of things. There's just so many issues that fall into that. But without getting into pride, I think we all love a hero. We all want to be the hero. We, in, in movies, the, uh, they spend billions of dollars every year um, on movies and shows and, and situations or things that, they, that, that, that are on the media or whatever. Um, and the majority of the storylines are about the same. There, there's always a hero that shows up. There's always somebody who comes in and saves the day. There's always uh, somebody that does something great or sort of, and it's that, that person that saves the day. And I begin to think about this, and the definition of a hero is this, according to dictionary.com or Bing, whichever one I pulled it up on, I can't remember. The definition of a hero is a person that is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. A hero is a person that is admired or idealized for courage, outstanding achievements, or qualities. Three things to define a hero, courage, achievements, and qualities. Nothing wrong with that. I'm not here to beat that up. I I began to, uh, when I was studying and putting notes together with this, it all started uh, back in Colorado, but earlier in the week, but I thought about the song by Bonnie Tyler. Some of you will remember that. I'm giving my age up a little bit here, but um, the song Bonnie Tyler had out about a hero says, where have all the good men gone? And where are all the gods? 
Another line in the song says, up where the mountains meet the heavens above, out where lightning splits the sea. I could swear there's someone somewhere watching over me. Through the wind and the chill and the rain and in the storm and the flood, I can feel his approach like a fire in my blood. How many know everybody loves a hero? I was going to play a couple different hero songs and I I couldn't decide which one. So I finally found that one and, and played that one. You probably didn't notice it when we were going around talking to each other. But I want to talk for a few minutes today about a hero and, 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 and encourage you to be the hero. I want to talk about someone in Scripture who wasn't noticed, wasn't famous, wasn't necessarily idealized. Most people never heard of him, but he was a hero. If you have your Bible, turn with me to the book of Judges, chapter 3. His name was mentioned only two times in Scripture. Some of you, if you've been around church very much, you've probably heard him preached about because we, we do tend to preach about him. But I want to I go into this a little deeper today. He was not famous. He was barely noticed. But he was this. And everybody say this word after I, I say it. Say significant. Significant. I want to talk also today about the difference between being famous or significant. Do you want to be famous or do you want to be significant? His name's only mentioned two times in the whole Bible. Judges chapter 3, verse 31, a very simple verse. It says, and after him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who killed 600 men of the Philistines with an ox goad, and he also delivered Israel. Just for a second, I, I lost my ox goad. I do have a 10-foot stick because... Um, Actually, the stick is about 10 foot long and and a real ox goad that they would have had. It was basically a cattle stick. It was something that they used. It was sharp on one end, flat on the other. It was something that was very common that farmers used. This guy was a farmer. He was a nothing. He was a nobody, if you want to say it like that. He wasn't anything, he wasn't anything of a big deal, but he was, he was in this book of the judges. He was in the same book with guys like Samson and Deborah, who we talk and preach a lot about because of, of what they did, and we make a big deal about them so much. But there's several people in the book of judges who were judges or made a significant difference that are rarely talked about or noticed. He wasn't famous, barely noticed, but he was significant. And I'm sharing this today for two reasons. Number one, because when we were in the mountains on Monday um, earlier this week, how many know that when you, when you get in the mountains, you feel pretty insignificant? Amen? You realize just how small everything is. You get, the higher you get in the elevations, you realize how small everything is. I think that's why even in the Bible that there's a verse where it says, come up higher. We get up, in, we get up where God's at, get up to where his perspective, come up in the spirit. He told the prophet, uh, he yanked him. I, I like to say it like this. I believe it's in uh, Isaiah 5, chapter 5 or 6, where he reaches down and he grabs the prophet by the hair of the head. This is my interpretation. Yanks him up in the heavenlies and gives him a vision of what things are really like. He had been preaching, whoa, 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 to everybody up until that point. Woe is this. Woe is that. Woe is this. Woe to you for this. And all of a sudden, he gets up in the heavenly realms, in the spirit realm with God, and he begins to see how things really are, and God touches his lips with the coal. And he comes back down, and he quits preaching, woe to everybody else. And he says, woe is me. I am undone. And he begins to change and preach a whole different message after he gets in the perspective or gets to the place of the view where God sees things. And, and so we, we, we went up into the mountains and the higher you get, the, the smaller and more insignificant you feel. And the second reason is because of you. The Lord told me to speak this to this church this week. And so many times we hear of the, the greats of Scripture. And over and over in the book of Judges, people like Deborah and Samson and those people in Scripture. Um, but Shamgar, not so much. I'm here to encourage you today that you can make a difference. You may not be famous, but you will be significant. You may not be famous, but you will be significant. Because famous to God and famous to people are two different things. We have such a fame-sensitive society in the world today. Everybody wants to be famous. 
Everybody wants to be seen. It's the one and done, I call it. The one shot to success mindset. That we're all looking for this one shot, this one door, this one opportunity for us to be noticed, for us to be seen. God's not near, about, near as much about being famous as he is about being significant. See, when God works through you, it is automatically significant. Because the word significant basically means signature. There's, there's something signed on this situation. There's, there's something uh, very unique about this situation. And, and if God wants us to be significant, how many know that when, you, when God works through you, it's already got his signature on it? When you step out in faith and give somebody a word, Ted, I appreciate you obeying the Lord last week and giving several people words. When you operate in the gift of God in your life and you say things to people, you don't have to worry about you anymore because it's His signature that's on that. It is significant. It does change people's lives. It does matter what we say and what we do. Shamgar was a farmer. A friend of mine preached this 20-some years ago. I heard him use this, this term about this same message. He said he was a nobody with a nothing. Anybody ever feel like a nobody with a nothing? It's like, really, what am I going to do in the world? What mark am I going to leave? You're the one I'm here to talk to today. The only thing he had was a farm tool, a stick, and he slew 600 army Philistines. He slew 600 guys with a stick. That's all he had. Tell your neighbor that's all he had. Could you imagine, and I've said this before, I've preached this here before, but I'm going at it a little different angle this time. Could you imagine him getting up one morning? He's a farmer. Most farmers get up early, we drink coffee. We sit in a chair till we wake on up. <laughs> we plan our day. We get to thinking about stuff. And I could just imagine this. This is my interpretation of the story and my imagination of it. I just see Chamgar getting up one morning. He's probably drinking his whatever he's drinking over there. I don't know that they had coffee. And you know, 600 soldiers coming would make some noise. It'd be a little vibration. You could... I wonder if he just sat there and he looked over there and water in his cup began to vibrate a little bit. All of a sudden he got this feeling. Something good not going to happen. So he gets up and he walks out the front door of his little house. Leaned up there beside the front door is that stick. He walks outside the front door. He sees the dust coming over the hill. He knows there's several something coming. You ever, you ever just have that feeling and you get that cold chill go down your spine when you know something's fixing to happen? I don't know what it is, but it's fixing to happen. He reached over and picked up that stick, walked out in his front yard, and waited. And here they come. They come to destroy him. They come to destroy his family. There were 600. Six is the number of man. 600 was coming at him. Man was coming to destroy God's people. Man was coming to destroy this leader that God had set up, this person of significance that God had set in a particular situation to do a specific thing at a specific time. And here they come. And I just, this is my interpretation of it. I could see them all riding up on their horses or their chariots, whatever they came. They may have marched up to him and stood right in front of him. And he's standing there, one guy, 600 people in front of him. He's standing there with a stick. And they probably begin to tell him what they were going to do. And I think he just said, not today. You ever have that feeling? When the enemy comes in at your life, the enemy comes towards your family, whatever God has told you, you're doing your job, you're doing your thing, and all of a sudden evil shows up, or something comes up in the situation, and you get this threat. How I many you know you can be a great man of God? You can call fire down from heaven and burn up the sacrifice. The Bible says that it licked up the water. That's pretty powerful. Water usually does the other thing to fire. But fire in that story, when Elijah called down fire from heaven, the Bible says that the, water licked, or the, the fire licked up the water and it actually burned up the rocks. 
We usually use rocks to contain a fire. How many know you're a man of God when you can speak and call fire down from heaven? It's one thing for us to act on the word of God. God speaks and we act. But it's another thing when we speak and act and God moves. Elijah stepped into another realm of a relationship with God to where it wasn't about just what God spoke to me anymore. It's about when he decided to say something, he knew God would back him up. And he, he steps out and he, he does this and he, he, he kills the prophets of Baal and 450 prophets he sl- slays that day. He kills him in front of everybody and one woman makes a threat. And all of a sudden he runs. How many know a threat can be very powerful? It's the threat of losing your marriage. It's the threat of losing your home. It's the threat of losing your job. It's the threat of losing your health. It's the threat of your children not turning out right. It's the threat. It's the threat. It's the threat. But how many know a threat can be powerful? But I'm here to encourage you today as a parent, as a, as a, as a, a child of God, as a Christian, as a believer, if we would get the mentality of Shamgar and step out with what we have and say, not today. Because the Bible says tomorrow is promised to no man. We're not supposed to take thought for tomorrow or the things of that or those kinds of things because the pro- tomorrow is promised to no man. We are to live for today, not with to be totally irresponsible. I'm not saying that because a good man leaves a, a treasure and inheritance for his children's children. I do believe that we do that, but that inheritance doesn't just mean money. How many know the inheritance that we leave for our children and grandchildren is a relationship with an almighty God that they know that you can step out in your front yard and say, not today. Amen? When, the, when, when whatever, whoever comes at us and they say, you can't do that anymore. You can't pray in school. You can't say the name of Jesus. Not today. You're not stopping me today. I don't care what I have, but I'm not bowing. Amen? Not today. Tell your neighbor, not today. He's a farmer. Insignificant, seemingly. The only thing he had was a stick. But something came up in him. And he says, not today. He didn't have a prominent position. He didn't have a title. He didn't have money. He didn't have influence. As far as the world's concerned, God had begun to use him. Obviously, there's no other record in Scripture of him. The only thing we know of him... Can you put that verse back up for me real quick? The only thing we know of him is who his daddy was. Slap your neighbor and say his daddy's name was important. After him was Shamgar. During worship today, God said, look up his father's name. He was the son of Anath. You say, well, what's that? You know what Anath means? The answer. After him was Shamgar. He was the son of the answer. And God chose him to lead the children of Israel. He chose him to do something significant. He chose him to do something special. He was not mentioned hardly at all, but what he did was was substantial. It was significant because he was the son of Anath. He had the answer. Tell your neighbor, we got the answer. He's my daddy. Amen. He's your heavenly father. He is the answer to every situation. He has it all. He didn't have money or influence, but he did have a father whose name was the answer. How would you like to think about that all your life being called, hey, there's the son of the answer. There's the result of the answer. (laughs) There's the result of the answer. There's what the answer produced, Teddy. (laughs) I think I'd wake up every morning with a pretty big smile on my face. Matter of fact, I am. (laughs) This is what the answer produces. (laughs) I told that to my wife one time. She laughed just like you did. I said, I'm here. I'm the answer. (laughs) Three things about him, and I'll let you go. If you're writing these down, write these down. Number one, about Shamgar. He may have seemed insignificant. He wasn't because his father was the answer. But number one, he started where he was. He started where he was. Three principles of being a hero. Three principles of being significant. Everybody say significant. Hero. There's three principles to this. He started where he was. So often people think if they don't do something big, it doesn't matter. 
But your Bible says in Zechariah 4.10, Despise not the days of small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. I'm going to read that again. See, we all can quote the first part, but most people don't get the second part of this. That's the part that's most important. Amen? Because the answer is talking. Despise not the day of small beginnings. Everybody say start. Where he was. For the Lord rejoices to see the work begin. God loves to see. He rejoices. The Bible says that, that the angels rejoice when one sinner or one backslider comes back home. And we make a big deal of that. But how many know I think it's a big deal when God rejoices? God rejoices when He sees the work begin. Tell your neighbor, start something. you got to start where you are. Too many people are looking for the big door, the big opportunity, the big stage, the big platform, the big service, the adult service. I don't need to go any farther there. One-shot American Idol mindset or idea. It's in our culture today. Everybody wants this one big shot. If somebody big would notice me, they try to connect with somebody big so they'll be noticed. The Lord spoke to me in the mountains the other day. He said, you may never be famous, but you are significant. Amen. He said, tell my people that. You may never be famous, but you are significant. And these kind of people and this kind of mindset causes us to lose it, causes us to miss the everyday, today opportunities that are right in front of them. I see it all the time with people. People have giftings or talents or abilities, and the opportunity is right in front of them to use it, to develop it, to be around other people that do that. But it's not big, so they don't want to do it. It's not something to be noticed, so they don't want to do it. How, how many know that if you will just start where you are and begin, God will rejoice? If you want to go anywhere, you have to start from where you are. I mean, this is going to get real elementary and real practical, but it'll it just kind of hit you upside the head sometimes. If you want to go anywhere, you have to start from where you are. Anybody ever use your map app on your phone? What's the first question it asks you? What's your location? <laughs> uh. <laughs> and when you're lost, you basically just have to bing. I mean, or <laughs> drop a pin. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> and then it says, well, where do you want to go? And then you hit route or go. And it tells you the directions starting from where you are, how you're going to get there. Amen. Amen. But you need to, need to be reminded this morning that God rejoices when you start moving. God rejoices. Doesn't that sound like faith with works creates stuff? You can believe i got a vision for my life. I can believe that God wants to do great things in my life. But if I stand here and just think about it all day long, how many of you will never achieve it? Start where you are. He is faithful in... Let's do that verse, Luke 6, uh, 16, 10. Tell your neighbor, current location is where we're starting from. Luke 16, 10. Jesus said that he who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. If people are not faithful in the small things, how many know they're never going to be faithful in the big things? Lord, if I could just win that lottery ticket. I'm going to hurt some feelings. And God says, if you'd be faithful with the money I gave you, I could probably give you more. Because I told you in my word, I give seed to the sower. Some of y'all ain't sowing. Some of y'all ain't putting God first. He said, watch this. And he said, who is unjust in what is the least is also unjust also in much. That's why it's the little foxes that spoil the vines. It's when you're in, you're in a, a group of your friends and they're just doing just a little bit of stuff. They're just a little bit of bad. Just a little bit of unintegrity. Just a little bit of, well, what just, we, that's not that big a deal really. How many know when it gets to be a big deal, if they were unfaithful in the little things, they'll be also unfaithful in the big things. That'd be like us being married, us men, and having our wife. She just flirts a little. 
It's okay. It's no big deal. Might not be. But given the right opportunity, it's a big deal. Amen? We are the bride of Christ. He is our husband. We are already married to him. Amen? He presented, past tense, her to himself, your Bible says, without spot. He did that to present her to himself without spot or wrinkle. He's not going to do that. He did that. He washed his bride clean. He paid the price on the cross. He took the stripes on his back he, to present her to himself that way. If we are the bride of Christ, how many know we probably ought to not flirt with some other man? We ought to not flirt with other opportunities that have nothing to do with God or his purpose in our life. We ought to be faithful to him. Amen? It is a big deal who's first. It is a big deal. God began to deal with us a, a month or so ago about who's first. Is he really first or is he not? People always get mad when I get on this subject about money and finances with it. If you don't put God first in your money, you're not going to put him first in anything else. We could just continue on down, read the next three verses of that. Did I give you the other verses? Let's just go ahead. I've already made everybody mad. Let's just do it. <laughs> I'm the son of the answer. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, everybody say money. Who will commit it to your trust, the true riches? In other words, people, a lot of people sometimes want a big spiritual gift or they want this, this big ministry, these kinds of things. And God said, if you're not even faithful to me with money, how could I trust you with more powerful things like a spiritual gift to really operate and really flow and really be noticed and really be seen? If you're not going to put me first, because this is the thing I say all the time and people get mad at me about this too. It's not God and the devil. That's not our choices in this world. Everybody wants to talk about the devil and hell and the devil and hell and God or the devil. It is nothing to do with God and the devil. Near as much as what Jesus said because, next verse, if you have not been faithful in what is another man's, you will give, who will give you what is your own? Have you ever had, have you ever borrowed something or rented something from somebody else? My dad started this with us as little kids. He said, anything that you use that somebody else's or anything that you borrow that somebody else's, you always take it back better than how you got it. I said, why, dad? And he said, several reasons. But number one, it's the right thing to do. It's called honor. Number two, if you ever need to do anything or use anything again, you've already got good credit. They respect you and they'll tell all of their friends about it. They'll tell, hey, when they borrowed this such and such of mine, they brought it back, they washed it. Can you believe that? Yeah. No servant can serve two masters. Here's our only two choices in life. For either he will hate one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Stay right there with that verse. And here's why. This is in red from Jesus, not Mike. Because you only have two choices. You have one of two masters in your life. And I'm going to go a little further with this in a minute. For either you will hate one of them. How many in here hate money? Nobody hated it. And love the other. You only got two choices. Or else you will be loyal to one. And despise the other one. You can't serve God of money. God's got to be first in your money. Just as much as your time. Just as much as everything else that we do. Amen? I know this is tight, but it's right. Number one, you have to start where you are. Number two, use what you have. Shamgar started where he was. He was, as far as we know, he was at his place. He was minding his own business. He was doing whatever God had told him to do, wherever God had placed him. Bloom where you're planted. Number two, use what you have. He didn't have a lot, but what he had, or what he had, he used. You could say he had limited resources, because we hear that a lot from everybody. I, I've said it a hundred thousand times myself. I'm pretty limited on my resources. All he had was a stick, sharp on one end, flat on the other. A stick. Think about it. He had a stick. 
Every one of you sitting in front of me today or listening to me today have something. God puts something in your hand. Not in my hand, in your hand. I don't need to be worried about what you have in your hand. I need to encourage you to use what you have in your hand. You don't need to worry about what I have in my hand or compare to what I have in my hand to your hand because your hand is not my hand. He didn't give you what he gave me. He didn't give me what he gave you. Bubba has a whole lot more to work with in a physical body than I do. I can pout about it and be upset or mad about it or I can just encourage him, use that. Amen? I can build him up in it. I can say, how can I help you? What do we need to do with you? How can we help you? Or whatever. Just encourage one another. That's what it says when we come together. Say unity. When we come together, we need to encourage one another. Strengthen one another. Build each other up in our most holy faith. He had limited resources. All he had was a stick. But everybody has something. He puts something in your hand. Every time I hear that, your hand, I think of the story of Moses. Remember the story of Moses? God told Moses, here's what I want you to do. I want you to lead three million plus people out of Egypt into a promised land. He had never went camping before. He's taken three million plus people on a camping trip and they don't want to go. Anybody ever take your kids on a vacation or somewhere and they didn't want to go? In a minivan? With the dog? And the suitcases, and they're mad because you got up early in the morning because you wanted to get a head start, and they're grumpy because they stayed up late last night, and they're back there fighting. How'd you like to take three million? Come on, guys, follow me. Where are we going? I'm not sure. That way. Dad, are you lost? Nope. (laughs) You've been on that trip, too. I'm just not sure where I'm at right now. That's what my dad used to say. Are you lost, dad? Nope, just not sure where I'm at right now. He put something in your hand, Moses. He started making excuses to God. Moses started talking back to God. He said, but God, I, 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 I stutter. How, 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 how am I going to lead these people? I need somebody to talk, talk for me. He says, fine, get Aaron, take your brother with you. But it's not as important who can talk as much as who listens. He didn't take, because Moses didn't talk well, he didn't take the thing that was most important about Moses from him. He brought someone alongside him to make up the difference. Moses' key thing was he was listening. God doesn't need somebody to talk near as much as he needs somebody to listen. You can't be significant if you're talking all the time as much as if you're listening. It's the one person that sees the right opportunity at the right time to do the one thing that changes everything. That's what's important. Timing. But you can't see that unless you're listening. I love the story of Moses. And then he he asked Moses and he started making another excuse. Well, how am I going to do this? And he said, what's in your hand? (laughs) Nothing but a stick. God said, that'll do. Whatever I tell you to do with it, do it. Throw it on the ground. Tell your neighbor obedience. Obedience. When you use what's in your hand, it will swallow up the serpents of Pharaoh's army or Pharaoh right in front of you. Didn't make any sense. The serpents were, were out there in front and he said, throw your stick down. He throws his stick down and it turns into a snake and eats up what the enemy was trying to use to destroy him. What's in your hand, God will miraculously use to swallow up the enemy's plans or the enemy's, the enemy's intimidation. The same thing that was in his hand parted the Red Sea. Tell me that's not a big deal. Tell me that's not significant. When you're coming down and you're running and Pharaoh's army's after you and they're trying to catch up to you to get you back into slavery, back into bondage, and the only thing you got's a stick and God says, hold it up. And you have a Red Sea in front of you, and you hold it up, and the sea rolls back. That's significant. Amen? Stay with me a few more, a few more minutes. Some of you have giftings. Some of you have money. Some of you have ideas. 
Some of you have things that you can use. Some of you have passion. I'll get back to that in a minute and even prayer. Some of you have encouragement. When you use what's in your hand, it will swallow up the serpents of of Pharaoh. It will also part a Red Sea. Some of you have the best thing of all. It's called availability. Hmm. You're just available. I don't have anything, Pastor. I don't know what else to do. I'm just available. How many know being available is a big deal? Everybody, anybody ever try to find help? <laughs> and nobody's uh, available. But if there's somebody available, how many know that makes it go a whole lot better? Even if they might not be the best at it, if you just need a driver, if you just need somebody to come with you, if you just need a little help with something, if somebody's available, how many know that's significant? Passion. Some of you have passion. I had a guy tell me one time, he said, I don't know what you're good at, but you got a lot of passion. How many know your passion will create miracles? I'm going to give you a list of stories in the scripture. It was their passion that made God move. It wasn't God's timing. It was their passion who created the timing. Watch this. Sometimes it's our passion that determines God's timing. The woman with the issue of blood. Jesus was surrounded by people. He was doing ministry. People, the Bible says, they thronged him. They surrounded him. Everybody was pulling on Jesus. There was a crowd there. She had an issue of blood to the point that, that she could be stoned if she bumped into somebody. But it was her passion that said, if I can just get to him, I know I'll be whole. And she takes, her passion is what caused her to get down on the ground and crawl in between people. It was her passion that got her to get to the hem of his garment. She said, if I can just get to the hem of his garment, I know I'm going to be well. And she, her passion draws her there. And as soon as she got there, boom, he responded. And he said, who, who touched me? Peter's like, hello, everybody's touching you. Jesus, Jesus, I want something. I want something. Jesus, Jesus. But this woman had passion. Her passion is what turned Jesus to her. Blind Bartimaeus. Jesus was passing by. Bartimaeus was not on Jesus' list that day. Neither was the woman with the issue of blood. They weren't on the list that day. And he heard that Jesus was passing by. And he began to cry out with passion. He said, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And they said, shut up. You don't have to get so crazy during worship. You don't have to flail your arms around. I mean, hold the TV, go post, whatever the, you know. That's not necessary. If you know my passion for God, it is necessary. Because there's times in my life where I don't think it was God's plan that day to do something, but my passion is what drove it. I used to be a worship leader at some uh, fairly large churches. And one of the things I loved to do because my passion was to worship. My passion was the presence of God because I knew that all I knew is in my life that if I got in the presence of God or the presence of God showed up, everything changed. And so I would go in the middle of the night and drive over to the church and lay in the sanctuary in the floor and turn on worship music. And I would just cry out to God and I'd say, what do you want us to sing Sunday? What do you want? And he'd give me the song list. And that's what we'd sing. And he'd show up. But it's the passion. This isn't about me. It's about passion. Your passion. You say, maybe the only thing I have is passion. I'm here to encourage you today. Your passion will move God. Water to wine. Jesus said himself, timing's off, mom. He's just at a wedding celebration. It was not his time. If if I'm wrong, tell me. That's fine. But Jesus said it wasn't his time. His mom says, hey, We're out of wine. So, (laughs) not my problem. Anybody else ever say that at work? (laughs) Look at that. That's not my problem. Not my job. I had a friend that used to say that to me all the time. Not my job. Not my job. Mary looks at Jesus and she says, out of wine. It's not my time. I'm going to ask when I get to heaven what she, what look she gave him. Because there's no other word there in that story. He just says, Mom, it's not my time. (laughs) 
I think she gave him the mom look. I brought you in this world. I take you out. <laughs> Me and my dad make another look just like you. <laughs> Shouldn't tell your kid that. That's probably harmful. But he goes ahead and does it. And a miracle happens which changes everything. And it is significant. The miracle is not in what you don't have. The miracle is in what you do have. Think of the stories of the Old Testament. The woman that said, all we have left is enough stuff to make my son and me a little meal before we die. And the prophet said, give it to me first. What she had, the only thing she had, was the provision for everything that she would have. In my own personal life, I'd quit my job. Everybody thought we'd lost our mind. I'm sitting on my back porch one day, and the Lord began to deal with me. And I said, God, I've got three little kids in the house. We had a really small house. There was never a place where I could just worship like I want to because I love loud music when I'm worshiping, so I have no distractions. Sometimes if you come by here and I'm in my office, you'll hear it outside, but it's because I'm in my office and i got it cranked because I don't want to hear a door rattle. I don't want to hear a car going by. I'm, in, I'm, I'm worshiping. I'm just spending time with God. And I wanted a place like that, but how many know in a small house with three small kids, you can't pull that off? There's never a quiet place. Mothers, help me. Just 20 minutes of silence. So I'm sitting on the back porch, and the Lord said, build a prayer building in your backyard. I'm like, right. I have no money. Everybody thinks I'm crazy. I started making excuses like these guys. I have nothing. I said, matter of fact, God, the only thing I've got is about four tuba tins out there in the barn. He said, form it. And I'll fill it. So I went and nailed four boards together. And I had a small piece of plastic, 10 by 14. I laid it on the ground because down where we lived, you have to put a, a moisture barrier before you pour concrete. Or the concrete will sweat all the time. So I put a piece of plastic down, nailed four boards together. Went back and sat on the porch. Did it. <laughs> Phone rings. It was Wayne. Some of you remember Wayne. Didn't know Wayne that well at all. Wayne called, and he said, hey, I need you to come to church tonight at his church. We weren't even going there. I said, what for? And he said, I just need you to come to church. I got something for you. So I had called the concrete place. It was $168 for two yards of concrete minimum to fill that slab. Guess what he handed me when I went to church that night? A check for this some odd reason, $168. Next day, I called the concrete company, and I poured a slab. And the Lord spoke to me that day when I was pouring a slab, and he said, how you build this prayer building is how I'm going to build your life and your ministry. I speak, you obey. You move. God speaks, you move. You do what you have with what you have. Amen? Are we okay so far? People say, I'm not this or I'm not that. Yeah, but what are you? God gave the children of Israel a vision of the promised land, but they still had to move. They still had to use what they had. They still had to fight. But even in that, their weapons were not carnal. Remember the walls of Jericho when they crossed the river and they go in to take their promised land. They still had cities that were fortified. Jericho, the Bible says, was straightly shut up against them. No one could get in or no one could get out. What was the weapon that he had them use? First of all, obedience, silence. <laughs> Just obey and keep your mouth shut. How many know that's significant? Obey and keep your mouth shut. Walk around the walls. Then the last time he says go around the walls seven times and then shout and blow the trumpet with a voice of triumph and a voice of victory. Declare the thing and the walls fell down. Jesus, for the joy that was set before him, his passion, he endured the cross that he went through. It was his passion because he wanted to set people free. It was his passion that helped him endure the cross. Sometimes the biggest door opens with sacrificial obedience. One time we were building houses, and when you build houses, and sometimes you put in eight-foot doors instead of normal-sized doors, and those doors have four hinges. Normal doors have three. I was walking through the house one day, and the Lord spoke to me, and he said, uh, obedience is what puts... Uh, obedience is... Hi or, obedience is the hinges on the door the bigger the door the more obedience that you need to apply people that have big doors open to their life usually have been obedient for a long time they have a story behind them amen hinges are like obedience on doors 
You have to have passion. You have to, you have to have a vision for what it is. You have to see what it is and obey the Lord. You have to move. You have to start with what you have. Start where you are and use what you have. I love this, the story of Arnold Schwarzenegger. Anybody who know who Arnold Schwarzenegger is? He's built like this. He has two arms, two legs, but he's shaped different. Arnold Schwarzenegger was a skinny little kid when he was young. But he put up a picture of a bodybuilder and he said, I lived into that picture. I lived into that picture. I took a vision. I got a vision and put it in front of me and I began to move towards it. I began to do what was necessary to get to that point. Every day I began to lift. Every day I began to eat different. Every day I just kept my focus on the vision. You got to focus sometimes on what it is that God tells you to do. When you focus, it, it, you, you just keep building day by day and he become this bodybuilder you know his story but how many know because of the vision that he put in front of him and that he achieved what he achieved caused him many open doors I bet he had no plan when he was a skinny 16, 17 year old kid that felt bad because he was skinny and he wanted to be bigger and he got a vision in front of himself he had no idea that one day he'd be the governor of California opinions don't matter right here I'm making a point amen he had no idea that he was going to be a movie star because he had big muscles. I'll be back. See, you don't even have to be an eloquent speaker if you're built good. <laughs> I got to move on. You can get sleepy on me. Because of that, many other doors open for him. Number one, start with where you are. Number two, use what you've got. Passion. Passion's a big thing. i got to do passion and prayer, and then I'll hit one more point. Stay with me, please. If you get up and leave, I'm going to make fun of you. Passion. This is a really neat story. There was an orchestra conductor, and he was getting up to perform one of his first big performance as an orca orchestra conductor. And he was there, and he's reading across the music, and he's doing the thing, you know, how they're conducting the orchestra. And in the music, it says, loudly. And so he starts, he's passionately telling them to get louder and louder. And then the next line he goes to says, even louder. And he begins to flail his arms so hard that he literally threw his shoulder out of socket. After the, after the concert, the news media was there and the press was there and they began to make fun of him and they went up to interview him and they said, how do you feel? about throwing your arm out of socket leading an orchestra and he instantly replied I know some people who have lived half their life without enough passion to dislodge a necktie more or less throw a bone out of joint I feel pretty good amen I feel pretty good about my passion call me crazy if you want at least I'm moving Amen. At least I'm excited. And number three, number one, start with where you are. Number two, use what you've got. And number three, do what you can. Shamgar did what he could with what he had where he was at. Do what you can. Not what you can't do, but what you can do. So many people focus on what we can't do instead of what we can do. I may not be good at this, but I don't need to focus on the fact I'm not good at this. What I need to focus on is what am I good at and what can I do, and I'll do that. I tell young people all the time, action creates more action. You want a great job? Get a job. Start moving. Start doing something. Have a good attitude. Get a job as a waitress or a waiter. I could tell you countless stories of people who said, the only thing I could do was wait tables. And it turned into an opportunity that became a career because of a good attitude, good work ethic. And they showed up. And because they were there, this opened. But if they just sat back in the house and never done anything, how many know it's pretty hard to get noticed if you're locked up in your house pouting? Amen? But if you start doing something... It creates, action creates more action. And some may ask, well, I don't know what I could do. Give me some ideas of things to do. I'm glad you asked. Number one, pray. Anybody can pray. You say, well, I don't, I don't, I don't even know how the, word, the right words to say to pray. You don't need the words. My Bible says, matter of fact, even the groanings. God understands. 
when you can't even put it into words and you just weep and you cry and you say, God, I don't understand. I just got a burden for these people. I don't know what's going on, but I'm just weeping for these people. I, I just have them on my mind. I'm just, I'm just praying for them. I don't know what it is, but I, I just weep for them. You're doing something. Do what you can. Prayer will outlive the lives of those who utter them. Prayer will outlive the lives of those who utter them. E.M. Bounds made that statement. Bill Bright made this statement about prayer. It is impossible to over-exaggerate the importance of prayer. John chapter 14, Jesus made this statement about prayer. Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. What if we believe that? What if we believe, God, whatever I ask in your name, you'll do it. What if we had, we were so confident like Elijah that if I speak, he'll back it up. Amen? Prayer matters. Oswald Chambers made this quote, or said this about prayer. He said, men may shun our appeal, reject our message, oppose our arguments, but they are helpless against our prayers. Men may shun our appeal, Reject our message, oppose our arguments, but they are helpless against our prayers. I want to tell the story about this building, but I'm not going to tell it today because we're running out of time. But it was a prayer meeting that changed it. It was a prayer meeting that changed the minds of people who weren't going to allow us to have this building and then allowed us to have this building. And I can prove it. I'll tell you some other time. It's the most powerful thing we can do. Last Sunday... Cassie and I left after church. This goes with availability and just using what you have and doing what you can do. We left church. We had somebody in the hospital. We actually had somebody in the hospital, somebody who doesn't attend but watch online. They were wanting us to stop and see somebody there. We had already planned to go surprise my dad for his birthday. It takes about seven, seven and a half hours to get out there. And so I said, we need to leave after church as soon as we can. Uh, of course, as a pastor, you have this heart and this feeling. You need to go see people. You need to do this stuff first. But if you do that, you're going to be late. But it's been 10 years. Can't somebody else do some of it too? That was going on in my head. And so we were going to do it. We, we grabbed a quick, quick lunch and we were going to do it. And I said, no. I said, we have a body of people. We'll call somebody and somebody else can go be part of the body too. I shouldn't have to do every one. So we go home. We load up the horse. We take off. We go west. Cassie went to text somebody and found out that there was already two couples that had went out to eat, bought this particular person's favorite meal at the restaurant, and were taking it to her at the hospital without anybody telling them. Amen. Thank you. That's called the body. That's called somebody else had a burden. Somebody else can hear God. Somebody else can pray for people. Somebody else, not just one person, not just the pastor. Any of you, if your availability, if you're hearing, if you have a concern for somebody, follow that. Be the body. Be part of that. Amen? I appreciate that about so many of you because it's happening more and more and more here. And I am thankful for it because we are limited. If you only have one or two people that can do a job, how many know you can only do so much? That's why Jesus left. He said, I must go that the comforter can come because when Jesus was on the earth, he could only have about, he only had about 5,000 people that would follow him around at one time. He could only reach so many people and so much. But when the Holy Spirit came, then he would work through everybody. You don't have one Jesus. You got Jesus in everybody. Amen. You can heal the sick. You can raise the dead. You can part waters. You can do miracles. You can do it. Tell your neighbor you can do it. Stay with me. We're almost done. One more quick story. This is a true fact. We get to Falcon, Colorado, just east of Colorado Springs. My trailer lights aren't working. I took my horse because I have always wanted to ride my horse in the mountains. All my life. Dad's been from there. They, all my families. I've never rode in the mountains till last year. One time I got to ride with my dad. And I said, this year sometime I'm going to ride my horse in the mountains. So we bowed up and left. So we get to Falcon. It's almost dark, so I pull in to wiggle my trailer light wires. Because, you know, that's what you do, is you wait till you get on a trip to make sure they work. <laughs> Use what you got. <laughs> so I pull into Safeway parking lot. 
go back and start messing with my wires. They won't come on. So I'm thinking, well, I had hauled some hay with uh, Dean a while back, and my plug was messed up and burned up the brakes on a trailer. So I thought, well, maybe I blew a fuse in my truck. So I started, I have another little issue with my truck about it starting. There's three different issues on a Duramax, by the way. If you ever have issues starting it, call me. I can help you. There's three different issues. And so there was a loose wire was part of it, so I didn't want to shut it off till I got there because I wanted to not have to mess with it and make sure. So I left it running, and I thought, well, I'll check fuses. So I started checking fuses, and I pulled one out that wasn't had anything to do with the lights. But when I did, the lights on the dash flickered, and the door dinger started going off. And I thought, well, that one's obviously good. Boop, plugged it back in. Went back, worked on the plug some more, got them working. It was actually the plug. Put tape on it, you know, because that's how you fix wires. You put black tape on them, kind of just watered all up together. And it worked. Get back in the truck, drop it in reverse. There's no reverse. Pull it in drive. Kick, 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 king. Goes in gear. I start to go, and it'll just barely move. I said, well, praise the Lord. I just lost my transmission. In Falcon, Colorado, it's dark. I have a horse in the back, and I know no one. Amen? <laughs> what did you say? Ride the horse. Yeah. I had Cassie and Kendra with me also. I didn't think he would ride three. Maybe two, but that would be his name's Twister, so. <laughs> Sled him. <laughs> Pull him. They could walk behind and drag their luggage. There's only two more hours in a car, so we'd surely get there by morning. Anyway, what I found out later, well, and as soon as this happened, you're a little overwhelmed, or I was. And so I got out of the truck, and I'm standing there, and this truck pulls up. Boom. And this young cowboy steps out, and he's got a cowboy hat on, big old dial spurs on. He said, you having problems? I said, yep. He said, can I help you? And I said, well, I think I just lost the transmission in my truck. He said, anything you need, I'm here. I'll help you. I'm thinking, how are you going to help me? He had a refrigerator in the back of his pickup. He said, where are you from in Kansas? And we chit-chatted. i got to shorten this story up. Anyway, I got his number. He lived about 15 minutes away, and he had a place to put a horse for the night. So I'm thinking, hey, that's a miracle. Amen? And when did he come? As soon as I stepped out when I had a problem, I stepped out of the truck, and whoom, he's right there. So I'm thinking, I know no one here. My dad is two hours up in the mountains. It's late. He can't come down this time of night to do this. Somebody's got to get my horse. About that time, I get a text from somebody. I said something about not good time. I think I just lost my transmission. Comes back. Dude, I know people in Colorado Springs. What do you need? Second help. Then I get a call. My sister lives in Canyon City from another guy. My sister lives in Canyon City. I heard about this deal. Um, I'll have them come and get your truck and trailer, take you back to Canyon City, which that would be great because mom and dad have a house there we could stay at, leave my horse at his place, and then the next day we'd go on up in the mountains. Now I have two people helping me. Amen? Tell your neighbor, God knows. So I tell Cassie and Kendra, we all go to Wendy's because we're going to wait for a while for somebody to come. I'm sitting there thinking, that can't be it. Ain't no way. So I walked back outside and started walking to the truck. I called Gail, Vander Giesen. <clears throat> I told him what I did, and I said, could, this, could that fuse have done it? And he said, maybe. It's only one way to find out. Disconnect your batteries, leave it set, touch your battery cables together, zero out your computer, hook it back up. I did, boom, fixed it. So I call off the help. I'm excited. We get back in the truck. We go on. We have a great trip. Everything's great. Amen? I get back. I'm visiting with somebody who attends the church and started, I was telling them the story. And as soon as I get into the story, he goes, what time was this? And I told him, of course, we're an hour ahead there. And right about that same time, there was a young girl, and I mean young, nine, ten years old, that was with her family and told her family or asked and said something to the effect of, I'm not going to get this exactly right, weren't Pastor Mike and Cassie going to Colorado today? Yeah. I think we should pray for them to have safe travels. <laughs> don't tell me God don't hear prayers. Some little girl prayed for me. 
And as soon as I stepped out the door of my pickup, whoom, there's one. Text, here's another. Call, here's another. Amen? I hate it when I hear people say, well, all we can do is pray. I want to grab you by the throat. And say that is the most powerful thing that you can do because you're talking to my father and your father about a situation and you don't think he cares? He absolutely cares. Amen? Emma, thank you for praying for me. Number two, you got to focus. Paul said this one thing I do. Forgetting the things which are behind, press towards the mark of the high call of my life. You will produce what you focus on. Don't look to the left or the right. Don't look back. Stay focused. Every one of us are given 24 hours, 1,440 minutes, and 86,400 seconds every day when we wake up as far as we know. We all have the same amount of one thing. It's called time. I was doing a funeral last week, and the Lord gave me this verse, Psalms 34, or 39, verse 4. Where David says, <clears throat> Psalms 39, verse 4, where David says, Remind me, O Lord, how many know God knows how many days we have to live? God knows how much time we have. God knows what's available. So it would be God that we need to uh, check in with about how we use our time. Psalms 39 verse 4. Did I give you that one? I'm sorry. Don't be mad at Taylor. Sometimes it's the guy up here that messes it up. Psalms 39 verse 4 says, Lord, make me to know. Another version says, remind me to know the length of my days, and what is the measure of my days that I may know how frail I am. Another translation that I read says that knows how fleeting the time is. We all have a certain amount of time. It's what we do with our time. And then this is the other verse that he reminded me of, Matthew 6, verse 21, and Luke 12, 34. Don't worry about those, Taylor. But Jesus said the same thing in both chapters. He said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And everybody preaches it on money, and I get that part. He is talking about money in there. But how many know there's one thing that we all trade for money? Time. We work by the hour. We work for the job. We do things. We offer our services. Whatever it is, we all trade time for money. Where your treasure is. So you could, you could say where your time is spent is also where your heart is. I'm not trying to be mean this morning. He checked me on it. It was, a, it was a plus to use at the funeral I preached because this dad, he worked to provide his family. But the rest of his time, he was so concerned about his daughters and his wife and his family. You could tell what was important to him by where he spent his time. Amen. And don't quit. If you quit, you're guaranteed to fail. Those are sub points of the last one. Number one, start with where you are. Number two, use what you've got. And number three, do what you can. Amen? If you want to be a hero, start with where you are. Start where you are. Use what you've got. Amen? And I went totally blank. What was the third point? Help me, somebody. (laughs) Nobody can remember either. Powerful message, Pastor. I don't know what you said, but it was good. Do what you can. Stand with me. we got to get out of here.